We're talking about tides today. Tides on Earth, tides in the solar system, tides in galaxies. So tides are simultaneously very simple and very complicated. Well, it's a good question. What, is, what causes the tides on Earth? It's like, what, why is the sky blue? It's one of those questions that kids ask and often stumps grown-ups. You might naively think, well, it's just the force of gravity from the moon pulling on the Earth. The Earth's surface is mostly water, and so that water gets pulled to one side of the Earth, and that causes a high tide. Uh, if that were the case, though, we'd only have a high tide once a day. We actually have it twice a day, every 12 hours. Uh, so there's something slightly more complicated going on. And in physics, we talk about tidal forces. And this is a generic term, and a tidal force is not the main gravitational force, but it's the differential force. It's caused by the fact that the pull of the moon on this side of the Earth is stronger than the pull of the moon on that side of the Earth. Which means that if you just think about the Earth sitting here with the oceans around it and the moon over here, this side gets pulled hard this way, the middle, the Earth itself, gets pulled a little less, and then the, the stuff on the far side, the oceans on the far side, gets pulled even less. And so it's the difference in the force of gravity felt in this position versus that position that leads to the tides. So the net effect of all that is that that sort of stretches the oceans out. And that's why you end up with two tides, two high tides, because the near side is getting pulled towards the moon, and the far side is actually getting pulled less than the Earth is, so it kind of gets left behind. We've got the moon over here, and we've got the Earth over here. This side of the Earth is being pulled quite strongly. The middle is being pulled a little bit, and the far side is being pulled not so much. So because these are vector forces, we can actually subtract one from the other. And when we do that, we get something that looks like this. We get a net force in that direction on this side of the Earth, which is the side with the moon. And we get a net force, a remaining force, in the opposite direction on the other side. And it even happens at the top and bottom of the Earth that there's a net force inwards as well. And because the Earth is most, the surface of the Earth is mostly water, what happens to the Earth is that it gets slightly squashed and slightly stretched on both sides. The complicated part is that isn't actually what happens with tides. That if you, so a prediction of that, for example, is that would tell you that actually high tide ought to occur when the moon's directly overhead, because that's when the, the moon's pulling the ocean that way, or when the moon's around the far side of the Earth. If you actually look at tide tables, you find that's not when high tide occurs, typically. It can be several hours out. Um, and that's because the oceans don't instantly respond to this. They don't actually instantly form this shape because they have to kind of slosh around the Earth and rearrange themselves in order to actually produce the tides themselves. So the reality is that tides on the Earth are a complicated mixture of the driving physics, which is the moon kind of tugging the, the oceans out, and then the way the oceans actually respond, which is the complicated part, which is all to do with the topology around them, where the coastlines are, what the sea floor is like, how deep the oceans are, and so on. It, I mean, the moon's far away, which means that the pull of gravity of the moon is actually quite weak, which means that the difference between the pull of gravity on one side and on the other side is even weaker. So actually, tidal force is a very weak force, but it's enough. It's enough to actually distort the ocean. If you think about it for a moment, in fact, the pull of gravity of the sun is a lot stronger than the pull of gravity of the moon, because although the moon's a lot closer to us than the sun, um, the sun's much, much, much more massive. And so actually, you know, that's the reason why we orbit around the sun. We don't orbit around the moon. So in fact, the, the gravitational influence overall of the sun is far more important than the moon. But because the sun is so far away, that means the difference in gravity between one side of the Earth and the other side of the Earth is very small, because actually the difference in distance is a tiny fraction of the total distance to the sun. Whereas the moon, because it's a lot closer, the difference in distance to the moon from one side of the Earth and the other side of the Earth is a much bigger factor, and that kind of wins out. So although the gravitational influence of the moon is much weaker than the sun, the tidal influence of the moon is actually stronger than the sun. Well, again, in the solar system, you get really interesting uh, configurations going on when you have large planets and not just one, but lots of moons. So, of course, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It has many, many moons, some of which are almost as big as planets themselves. The moon closest to Jupiter, orbiting closest to Jupiter, is called Io, and that's a really interesting object. It's the most geologically active body in the solar system. It's got volcanoes going off. Its surface is constantly being renewed because of all this volcanic activity, all these earthquakes or moonquakes that are happening. 
And that's because it's being tugged in all different directions. In one direction by the huge mass of Jupiter right next door, but also by these other major, what we call Galilean moons, um, also in orbit around Jupiter, are pulling it in other directions. So its insides are constantly being squashed and distorted, and it's that uh, geological heating that's driving, this tidally induced heating that's driving all of the geological activity on its surface. In my, my own particular field mostly is studying galaxies um, and tides have a, a, a massive influence on galaxies because galaxies don't exist in isolation, they often exist in clusters and in groups and so once in a while one galaxy comes quite close to another and then the gravitational influence of one galaxy on the other can actually, the tidal effects can then stretch that galaxy out. So there's a very famous pair of galaxies called the antennae which are in a very close interaction with one another and the tidal effects then have pulled out these long beautiful tidal tails from these things. The leading tidal tails form sort of a bridge of material which is kind of obscured by the fact that they're, they're both colliding. The, the trailing tails in both cases are being flung off quite spectacularly um, behind each of the galaxies. So what you're seeing in the antennae galaxy is you've had these two galaxies that came close together and then so this galaxy feels the tidal influence of this galaxy, so it feels the gravitational pull, but the gravitational pull on its backside is weaker than the gravitational pull on its front side, which means that the stars at the back kind of get left behind, so it got stretched out into this long tidal tail. And then conversely, exactly the same thing's happening to the other galaxy, and it's getting stretched out by it, its companion too. Because tides are just basically the difference in pull of gravity between one side of a thing and the other side of a thing, wherever you've got gravitational forces influencing extended objects, then you have tides. And so, for example, a famous example in astronomy is if you've got a black hole, right, the pull of gravity of a black hole is incredibly intense, which means that the tidal forces, the difference in pull between one side of something and the other, can become very intense as well. If you're at the event horizon near the, what we call the edge of a black hole, that's a small black hole, you're very, very close into where most of the mass is. And that means a small change in your position um, will induce enormous changes in the gravitational force that you feel. So if I'm coming up to a black hole and I'm falling in feet first, my feet will feel an enormously different force compared to my head, simply because the small difference between them. And what would happen if I were to be so unfortunate as to cross the event horizon of, of a fairly small black hole is that my feet would be stretched far away from my head and the term for that is called spaghettification. So you're stretched into spaghetti because of the differential force of gravity.